How can we proactively identify cyber attacks before they occur? What are going to be the technical needs of our cybersecurity professionals as we advance over the next 10 to 20 years? What cybersecurity frameworks do we need to have in place to ensure effective development and policies for securing our networks? With the rise in the use of blockchain solutions, how does this affect cybersecurity policies and trends as well? So these are some topics that our keynote speaker, Vance Brown, as well as our panelists will also discuss. This is the biggest threat facing humanity that's coming, then it matters. This matters to all of us, right? Even though I think it's one of those things that's more under the radar. We know that Equifax, uh, you know, 145 million accounts were stolen, and some of you may be part of that. I know I was. We believe it's going to get worse before it gets better. In fact, one of three people in America last year were hacked in some way. How many had to exchange your credit cards? Or? It's a big deal, and if you look, they predict by uh, 2021 that cybercrime damages will be over $6 trillion. Uh, crazy numbers and stats. Uh, even today, they say that the cybercrime and the damages from that is, is larger than the drug trafficking crime. Well, we believe terrorism and warfare of the future is, is digital. The National Cybersecurity Center and our tagline is secure the world. We don't think we're going to secure the world by ourselves, but we want to be about that along with everybody else in this. We work under we, government and military with public policy and cyber awareness, education, workforce development. Do you know, in terms of jobs, there are 1.5 million unfilled jobs today in cyber. I've traveled and gone to the, to the schools that do have, uh, let's say, some high school program in cyber, and I'll walk in and it will basically be all white young males. No females hardly at all, uh, no minorities at all. And I'm telling you, this problem is way too big for the old and white males to solve. It's just not appropriate. And I was like, so I started asking some questions like, what is the problem here? And they say the trends they see is that, they're, that a lot of the females will be more interested, for instance, in up through like seventh, eighth grade, then all of a sudden for the stereotype or whatever, it's no longer cool. I thought, by the way, I thought IT was always cool. I never knew that wasn't cool. Uh, but apparently, but it is a problem. So the stereotypes are really messed up right now, and that's got to change. There's 9,000 cybersecurity jobs right now in Colorado, and the supply of workers is very low. So cybersecurity really is demanding very highly educated workforce. Um, we're looking at about 83% of the job postings in Colorado. Um, specify at least a bachelor's degree and at least three years experience and that's for an entry-level position so that's a little out of whack with a lot of under other industries because it's really hard to get into the field how do you get a certificate how do you get a degree how do you get a job without experience how do you get the experience without the certificates and so a little bit of a catch-22 so in very broad terms the the solution is employers government and education really working together to create these talent pipelines, uh, career pathways, really what are the critical roles and critical needs? What are the critical competencies? What certificates do you really need? A couple of things we need to do is really work on that competency gap that we're seeing. Uh, on the supply side, government and training providers really need to provide those better frameworks, and they need to be based on what the industry is telling us. What are the industry needs? There's also not enough instructors. Who's going to teach cybersecurity when, if you have that skill set, you're going to go out in industry and make double that? We need to have more entry points, multiple entry points into a career pathway. So really focusing on those entry level and mid level, or even within your company. How can someone within a cyber role advance? Um, we need to have clear knowledge, skills, and abilities identified for these positions. So one of the other things is we need to really work on the disparity between what hiring authorities or people in your company that are hiring these people, training these people, supervising these people, and what HR puts out there. If you look at the job postings, it's typically four-year degree, five years experience, CIS, SP. That's not entry level in any way, shape, or form. Really, we need to increase the number of women and minorities in the field. We need to recruit them earlier. 
We need to look at our language. How are we describing? I hear a lot of warfare. I hear a lot of fighting. We need to look at that. And how do we get more women and minorities into the field? I think that the key point for me with this as a business, depending on which industry you're, you're part of, if you're a regulated industry, um, being able to really go through the thought process to create um, the proper security strategy, being able to align that with a standardized framework, and then being able to keep it going and be keep your evidence up. I, I think that if we hadn't been able to demonstrate that evidence, um, that it would have been a totally different outcome that we, you know, from a self-certification process. And the amount of manpower um, of those entities that are actually trying to go through and certify you and get you through the process, um, they just don't have the manpower. And um, so I think um, it's really important for businesses to be able to understand the industry in which they operate, the requirements for that. Um, but it's also just good business. We see um, ransomware and phishing, and they, they both kind of stem from the same thing. Um, last year really was more of a year of, of ransomware, of attacking a single user and their single data. And so while obviously bad, it didn't have as much uh, repercussions across an organization. Um, so what now we're seeing is much more phishing attacks to get credentials, credential harvesting. Because really what we feel is the identity is really the new security perimeter. We, we're in a society today that it's got to be immediate, it's got to be right now, I've got to get everything done right now. But security takes a little bit of time. And we, we deal this with email delivery. When we have ways that we can investigate, use artificial intelligence to look at this, but the pushback we usually get from the end users, from the businesses, well, that's going to delay my message maybe a minute, maybe two minutes. And in cybersecurity, we have a long history of looking for a magic bullet. In the 90s, it was PKI. In the 2000s, it was encryption. And today, the king of hype is AI and blockchain. That being said, there is a, a nugget of truth behind this because security is fundamentally an information management problem. You have to have good instrumentation throughout your infrastructure that has to flow up to a central location and be analyzed and processed. And then you have to be able to take action on it in some sort of orchestrated fashion. Now, this is mind-numbingly dull work. And it's one of the reasons why we have a lot of transient staff in our security operations centers. And when you have a, a shortage of jobs like we've been talking about, you don't want to inflict that kind of grunt work on your staff. So we can leverage AI and machine learning, cognitive, those family of technologies to address some of that analytics and orchestration in the automation. Now, the, the emerging threat here is that we're looking, starting to see adversarial AI. When the bad guys can go out and can use the machine learning platform built into Amazon or Azure or Softlay or IBM Cloud or one of the other platforms, they can learn your environment and learn how to change what's normal in your environment and fly under the radar and hide. So it, it's like any tool, it's good and bad. Uh, blockchain is a, is a fascinating technology. It has the capability and the potential to transform everything from financial services to logistics. It's based on cryptography. It requires an infrastructure around it that's been secured. And like anything, we have to be prepared for it to break. And that includes for the crypto to fail. And that's a topic that nobody's really talking about, is what happens if somebody, quantum computing, some future advance in mathematics, breaks the crypto behind blockchain. So it has to fail gracefully. And that's something key with anything we do in security. How can you run in failure mode safely? If you have malware, for example, in your grid, you can't just turn the grid off. People die. So how do you operate in a cyber safety mode instead of cyber security? And whether it's blockchain or artificial intelligence or any other technology, that's what we really have to focus in on. For AT&T, the way we do security is on our network on a given day, uh, we see somewhere around 190 and upwards petabytes of data uh, going across the network. And so effectively what we do is we baseline the network and we look at it and say, what should it look like? And then we look for deviations from the norm. 
where we can then apply a wide range of security tools against those deviations. The deviations could be for obvious reasons, like I could show you an example of what the network looks like, like when the Super Bowl happens, you'll see big spikes in traffic and, um, or if a certain event's going on. In that situation, you kind of know what's happening. In a lot of cases, we see small deviations uh, continually across the network on different ports and protocols, um, and we can correlate those back to cyber incidents, and then we have a security team. And what they'll do is they'll look at that data, they'll identify those threats, and they'll try to develop a response plan. And a lot of what we do now is shifting even more and more. You talked earlier about AI and big data analytics. You know, we generate a ton of data off of the network because of the volume of traffic that we see. And so based upon that data, we can apply machine learning and other tools to look at that data, analyze the data, and look for those deviations from the norm. And we can try to stop the attacks at the network before they affect our customers. So that's basically how we do security at the 100,000 foot level. In terms of how that relates to the government, it's the National Security Telecommunications Advisory Council. This is the NSTAC for short. Um, it's a federal advisory body that reports to the president. We write policy recommendations um, to the White House on a wide range of security issues. Um, we've done reports in the last two years on things like how to deal with botnets, how, to, how, to, how emerging technology is going to impact security. That included AI, uh, big data analytics, uh, quantum computing, um, um, cryptology changes. Um, all those issues were captured there. There's an entity called the Communication Sector Coordinating Council. Um, and for every sector of critical infrastructure, they all have what's called a sector coordinating council that organizes that sector's activities on behalf of industry with the government. Uh, so we work very closely with the U.S. government on implementing different security policies through the sector coordinating council. An example of that would be uh, when the NIST uh, cybersecurity framework was under development. Uh, we did a lot of work with NIST on how to, how to draft the framework. And then subsequently, after it was developed, we did a lot of work on driving it, implementation of it throughout the communications industry, whether it was AT&T or any of our competitor companies that are, are part of that organization. The National Cybersecurity and Communications Integration Center. Um, this stands for the, the NCIC for short, for those of us who are in the field. Um, the NCIC is basically a 24 by 7 operations center that the U.S. government runs at the Department of Homeland Security. They monitor threats on a daily basis, um, and they exchange information to and from industry. So we actually have a person who's dedicated to the NCIC. We have an office in the same building. We have people in the room, but there's a classified area that uh, we have folks that are there who are dealing with the U.S. government on a daily basis, looking at cyber threats as they uh, go to and from. So a lot of what we do with government is, is truly trying to partner with them on staying out in front of the threats as best as we can and taking actions to deal with them. It's not perfect um, in terms of the question of how it's going to change. I think that's an evolving area. Um, there's a lot of things that could be done better, and we're constantly dealing with those issues in Washington. But um, I do think a lot of progress has been made over the last few years, and it continues to, to get better as time goes by.